Hello, everyone, and welcome to the AI show. I am Cassie Brevue, filling in for Seth Juarez, and I'm super excited to be here with you today. Um, we're going to be talking about PyTorch Profiler and Onyx Runtime Web. And the cool thing about today is it is the Friday before Halloween. So um, hopefully nothing too spooky happens on our stream today. OK, and so I am going to bring in our guest. Sabrina, welcome, Sabrina. Hello, thank you so much for having me. Thanks so much. Yeah, we're so excited to have you and to hear more about PyTorch Profiler. profiler uh, why don't you give us a little intro? Okay, do you want the real intro or the spooky intro? What do you <laughs> <laughs> Whichever um, one you think. Wait, let me. Let's do the speaky. <laughs> Like, Sabrina, the teenage witch, right? It's like you don't Sabrina need to the costume. Like no, I don't. I just gotta be myself. Sabrina, the teenage witch. <laughs> awesome. Awesome. Yeah. Thanks so much. Um, yeah. My name is Sabrina Smy. I am a program manager in the AI frameworks team at Microsoft, um, and our team sort of primarily works on open source projects like PyTorch and Onyx Runtime. And my particular focus is on PyTorch Profiler and Onyx Runtime inferencing. So. We actually partnered with Facebook on several of these projects, um, but um, I'd have to say I'm really excited to be a part of this show with you. And um, you know, I've seen the AI show many times, and it's like a huge honor to be a part of this and be with you, Kenny. So um, the honor is ours. We're so excited. <laughs> and PyTorch Profiler is such a cool product. So, and there's been some really great um, new features and a lot of really good advances there. So I'm excited. To hear about it. Yeah, sure, sure, sure. And let's um, see, we should look at the chat too. Let's see who is hanging out with us today. Um, so yes, you can see through my hat because of the green screen. And so this is like an old school Microsoft hat, right? I felt like it was Halloween and it was the right time to bring it out. And because of the green and yellow and because I have a green screen, you can see my <laughs> background. Um, and of course the cat headphones, I felt like were appropriate for Halloween as well. Very festive here. And your background's on point. <laughs> Thank you. And then I really should have this one though because I'm I'm getting taking over the AI show and becoming captain of the ship. Although I don't think <laughs> I have my captain hat with me today, so I'll stick with the Halloween background. <laughs> and your sound effect on right now. <laughs> oh, is it getting a little spooky? It was getting spooky. It was it? spooky. It was too spooky for us. No, no. <laughs> Too much. Okay. We don't want to scare people away. We like just started and then Seth won't let us take over his show anymore. It's kind of scary. So we have someone from Ecuador. Awesome. Oh, nice. Yeah. So thanks so much for joining us. And with that, I'll let Sabrina take it away. If let me add your screen. There we go. Perfect. Awesome. Awesome. Okay. Um, can you see my slide? Yes. Yes. Okay, awesome. Cool. So I'll just jump straight into my presentation uh, since I've already done the intro. So, yeah. Yeah. all right. So imagine, imagine that you are a performance engineer at a company and um, your job is to help, you know, identify potential bottlenecks in your deep learning system that's already in place and understand scalability issues that may occur, you know, before you deploy a finished product. Okay. So typically, this is how you would start your day. You would begin by, you know, running your deep learning model, capture traces along the way. And then in order for you to optimize your model, you would need to gather the profiling results, analyze them. Um, but the problem is, is that traces can be gigabytes and gigabytes of data. Cassie, cue the um, da-da-da. Perfect. 
wait, that was the wrong one. Sorry, I'm getting used to my sound <laughs> Which one was that one supposed to be? Was that drama? Yeah, yeah, it was drama. Yeah, drama. <laughs> So a lot problem. of data. <laughs> so, yeah, exactly. Terrifying. Terrifying. That is the problem. The problem is that tracing can be gigabytes and gigabytes of data. And processing them manually can be very time consuming and very annoying. So after you've identified the changes that you need to make to slightly optimize your, your model, you would need to rerun the model again, check the performance. And if the performance is great, then Hooray, like, you know, you're you're done for the day. Go grab yourself a celebratory. <laughs> okay, it stopped. <laughs> but, and feel free to cue the, the opposite effect. Um, <laughs> but if you, um, if the, you know, um, performance is not satisfactory, you're going to have to go back to step one and recapture a profile, gather the data, find out the reason for the bottleneck, fix it, and try it all over again, an n number of times until the performance is satisfactory. So this is the typical day of a performance engineer, and you can imagine how incredibly exhausting it is to go through that process an n number of times until you've optimized your model. But here at Microsoft, we actually partnered with Facebook to bring performance engineers data scientists, framework engineers, or anyone looking to optimize their PyTorch models and bring them a tool that allows you to automatically process your traces, um, analyze them, and then provide um, automated performance guidance to optimize your model. And that tool is called PyTorch Profiler. Awesome. So I will um, I will go over the new PyTorch profiler release, and um, I'll be talking about you know how to start leveraging this tool. I'll be covering some of the older features that um, that we have um, from the previous release. So um, I'll be covering things like um, you know distributed training view from our previous release, memory view, GPU utilization cloud storage support and a, a really cool VS code jump to uh, VS code feature called jump to source code. And then um, talk about some of the new um, features that we have um, in version 1.10 that just got released. So I'll actually go over uh, each of these and quickly summarize them. So the first um, feature in version 1.9 is around distributed training. So this feature um, actually helps you understand how much time and memory is being consumed in your distributed training job. So um, you can imagine um, many issues really do happen when you're when you take your train training model, split the load into different worker nodes, try to run them in parallel so that you know you, you speed up your your training. But sometimes um, what's happening in between that can be a black box and you know, your goal of applying this distributed training technique is to speed up your model training. Um, so having a distributed training view like this um, will really help you diagnose and debug issues within individual nodes, which is really, really, really helpful. So the second feature in version 1.9 that we had released in our previous, re uh, previous release is around memory view. So this view um, allows you to understand your memory usage better. And if you've run your Jupyter Notebook before and have done some pretty memory heavy things, I'm sure you've run into an issue uh, or error like this before out of memory error. And it, sometimes it's really frustrating. Sometimes it's really easy to pick up on, you know, why that error happened, but it's still a, a very pesky error to get um, that happens uh, quite often. So this memory view yeah. actually, um, shows you some active memory allocations at various points of your program run, which is really helpful. That's awesome. I remember dealing with a bug around memory usage and it ended up like to have to like clear the memory because it was actually it ended up being a memory leak on an older version of a deep learning framework. And it was um, the new version fixed it, but something like this probably could have helped find that issue, right? Exactly. Yeah, I think that's the most frustrating thing is like wasting so much time trying to figure it out. But if you don't have a memory view like this, you wouldn't be able to see all the active memory allocations at various points of your code to be able to find exactly what where that 
what happens with that. Yeah. Yeah. I wish I had that. <laughs> Sure, at that yeah. time now i do right now I can yeah exactly <laughs> yeah for for Python, yeah this is this is a really useful tool um so the third feature in version 1.9 is around gpu utilization and this is a, re a tool that i personally find really really helpful um and this helps make sure that your gpu is being fully utilized okay um and so uh you know oftentimes having close so your goal with gpu utilization is to get close to 100% utilization. And what that means is that you're using your hardware to its full extent and you are leading, leaving no performance on the table. Um, so your goal is to try to get as close to 100% as possible. And so having a GPU visualization like this um, really helps you figure out how to increase that uh, percentage. I suppose you could save money with that as well, right? Because if you're paying for GPU and GPU can be very expensive, um, the more you're using, the more efficient it's being and that's saving you then money on your training, right? Exactly, yeah. Sometimes, uh, you know, um, I've definitely had instances where we had so many, uh, so much hardware and then they were all running at 20%, you know, GPU utilization. Oh, nice. That is a total waste. And, um, you know, you're leaving performance on the table and, um, yeah, it's 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 a huge problem. That's why I think it's this is one of the most important uh, features that could really really help um, ensure that you're you're fully using your hardware. <laughs> so so yeah, um, and then the fourth feature is around cloud storage support. So uh, the TensorBoard plugin, which is a plugin that allows you to visualize um, some performance metrics, and that's where our PyTorch profiler actually lives. Um, can now read profiling data from, uh, you know, Azure Blob Storage, Amazon S3, um, you know, GCP, you know, Google Cloud Platform. So um, that's a small added feature that we have that, that can really help. So by profiler data, that's when it's collecting the data during training. And mm -hmm. when it's putting that into, is it a JSON format or how does it, what's the format that it collects in? And then that goes on st cloud storage. Is that what you're saying you could do now? Yeah, so um, so um, in terms of, uh, yeah, reading in some of the data and then it saves it into a Chrome trace file that can be visualized on TensorBoard. So oh, okay. now you can, you know, it support, you know, you can, it can read data from, you know, all pretty much m most of the major uh, cloud platforms now as of, you know, the last release, so yeah. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> I thought you were going to drop a beat after. It sounds like a beginning of like a... You know. It does. <laughs> if it wasn't for copyright, I don't have any uncopyrighted music. Otherwise, oh. I'd be so happy to drop a beat after that. With all, with all of these sound effects, you can make your own songs easily. <laughs> well, you know what? I probably could use GarageBand because I I've, have I've a rig here where I'm actually using my phone to do this. And like oh, GarageBand, you can like live mix. But I, I'm going to practice before we try that. So. Oh my gosh, our next uh, live, okay? Okay, deal. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> awesome. Um, okay, yeah, so the last feature on uh, PyTorch Profiler version 1.9 is a pretty fun feature, actually. Uh, it's a feature that allows you to visualize uh, stack tracing information on TensorBoard. And then when you click on a stack trace, it will jump directly into the source code where the bug is. So you can imagine how, you know, how much this will help in terms of optimizing and quickly iterating through your code, um, you know, based on your profiling results. So uh, let me see if I have a video. Do, there was a, sorry, I had a, it's right, it's right. I must, okay, yeah, let me just move this video up here. Oops. Cool, I um, lowered my gain on the horn, so someone said it was really loud, sorry about oh. that. Uh, so I have lowered the gain and hopefully next time. <laughs> well, you, were just, you were just hoping, you were just making sure everyone's paying attention and awake, you know. <laughs> exactly. We got pay attention. To and also I should say, this is like, I just figured out this soundboard setup. So this is totally yeah, my first yeah. trial of it. So I thank you for, for letting me know. Good for hopefully that. it's better now. <laughs> awesome. Okay, cool. So, um. Yeah, the last feature in version 1.9 is uh, jump to source code. So this is a feature, um, like I had mentioned. So this is TensorBoard. And Wait, we're not seeing your screen. Are we supposed nope. to see your screen right now? Yeah, you're supposed to see. Oop, did did my did I lose the screen share? Yeah, I think you got to reshare. Okie dokie. 
And then Joe Silva um, was asking about ML.NET or Event TensorFlow. So this is specific to PyTorch. Um, so it's going to work with PyTorch. And uh, I don't think it would work with ML.NET. Definitely won't work with uh, TensorFlow. Yeah, TensorFlow has their own um, profiling tool. Good question. Um, can you see my screen now? Should be TensorFlow. Um, let me grab that. There we go. Perfect. Yes, we can see it now. Perfect. Okay, cool. So, um, so yeah, so the, the, the last feature on version 1.9 was around jump to source code. So this is a feature that allows you to visualize your stack of tracing information. So this is TensorBoard and um, all those blue links are, you know, a list of just, you know, stack tracing information. And so um, if I were to click on one of them, you know, um, if I were to click on one of them, it jumped directly into the source code exactly where, you know, that bug was. So you can imagine, you know, how quickly you can optimize um, some, some of your, uh, your code just based on stack tracing information and some of the profiling results that you got just in a click of a button, which is super awesome. And um, it's done in Visual Studio Code and it's a fun feature to, you know, really use to quickly iterate through your, um, your code. That's cool. That's so cool. I, have, I have, if I have my code in Visual Studio or in VS Code, and then I have mm -hmm. PyTorch profiler, profiler running. So this is just a tab in that. And then I can click and it's like, hey, you have an issue right here. And it'll bring me directly to the issue. Yep. You would have okay. to launch the tensor board um, to be able to okay. be able to see that, to see the screen. But yeah, if and then if you were to, you know, view some of the call frames, um, mm -hmm. it would have a list of all your stack tracing information. Um, as shown here, you click on it and it literally splits the screen and jumps directly into your uh, source code, which is um, that, that contributed to that bug, for instance. Um, which That's, is, cool. uh, That's a new feature, isn't it? Because I've used, I've used Profiler before, but I have not seen that. Yeah, so this, this was um, in our previous release. We just released uh, a new release. We just had a new release um, about a week ago. So, um, but yeah, this is, this is pretty recent. So, so cool. Um, yeah, super exciting. And it's fun to show in demos because it just looks so cool just jumping to source code. So <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, super useful debugging. So I feel like debugging machine learning models and then hardware machine learning can get really complicated really quick. And so yes. saying, OK, I have a leak, but where is it? Like, how do I find it? And then exactly. that's where that's going to say, here, this is where you could optimize your code or do something a bit different. So exactly. Spot on. Yeah, exactly. Um, so I'll actually also quickly um, summarize some of the uh, features in version 1.10. Um, so we recently released a few enhancements to um, enhancements and a few new features. And the first one is around um, uh, correlating operators in forward and backward paths. So this helps map operators that are found in the forward paths to the backward paths and vice versa. And they can actually be visualized in um, a trace view to have, you know, um, details on 10 millisecond buckets and um, their states and elements and, and stuff like that. Um, and then the second feature is around enhanced, and we enhanced our previous memory view that we already have. So this helps you understand your memory usage better, but we have additional statistics on um, seeing the trends of your usage and, um, you know, selecting a span um, to be able to see some of those trends within your specified range that you, you, you've given um, the profiler. Um, and then the, the third feature that we added in this current release is around um, enhancing our recommendation, automated recommendation system. So um, this is really helpful for, you know, um, getting performance recommendations to help optimize your model. So whether you're lost on how to get started on optimizing your model, or you just need a quick few uh, actionable hints on how to really imp improve your GPU utilization or your memory um, consumption or time or things are taking too long and you just want quick actionable steps, um, the this automated recommendation system is um, is a place to check out. Do you have some yeah. examples? Like, I know there was one around workers, like how many workers you had running, but is there, like, what are some of the other ones that it can do? So um, 
in so in this current release, we added a few specifically around um, you know tensor core and glue, some of the new added features that we've had. Um, but it would it would uh, you know some of them would would talk about you know if your batch size is a little low, and you know I uh, I have a few examples in in the demo that I'll be uh, showing you in TensorBoard. Um, and so, yeah, so some of them uh, recommend like tensor core and, you know, it recognizes that your GPU utilization is low and then it would tell you, why don't you try, you know, increasing your batch size or, you know, implementing tensor core or, uh, you know, glue, um, if, if it's distributed training or, um, you know, things around your data size and, 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 and stuff like that. So. Awesome. awesome. Um, and then the, Fourth feature is around uh, distributed training. So along with your ability to diagnose distributed training on individual nodes, Glue is officially now supported, which is pretty pretty great. And then also Tensor Core is also now supported. So this is um, some updates on the PyTorch Profiler version 1.10. So, so Glue is for distributed training using? Yes, yes. Okay. Which is now supported. is that PyTorch specific? Um, it can be. I think it could be. Um, I know it's some of the common use cases are around PyTorch, but I'm not okay. familiar about the other uh, frameworks. But um, yeah, it's used in in like the back end. Um, but sweet. Yes. Okay. Cool. So now to um, I guess get started. It's uh pretty straightforward with, you know, getting started with a PyTorch profiler and starting to instrument your code um, to be able to use PyTorch profiler. Um, previously, um, if you've used the PyTorch profiler uh, before, you know, a while back, um, the profiler was only able to display performance information by printing a console like this um, that you see here on the screen. Um, and that's after you've imported, um, you know, the profiler and set the console manager and turned on and off the profiling features that you that you want. Um, but now, you know, a feature that Facebook and Microsoft collaborated on is uh, we work together on getting, you know, having the ability to export this old console dash to TensorBoard, which is a visualization tool similar to this over here. So, uh, by adding a, um, instead by adding a trace, uh, what is it, on trace handler, um, you know, the profile will start collecting all the inputs and then the traces will be saved in a Chrome trace file that can then be visualized in a tensor board um, similar to what you see here. So the first thing you'll need to do is import torch profiler in your code, then set up the, uh, context manager and this is the piece where you'll be turning on and on the, off the features that you know i talked about you know previously like memory view or uh distributed training or um you know gp profiling and um things like that we actually also do have a bunch of other advanced features that you can use with with profilers so um you know you can specify in your context uh, when to trigger, like, you know, which iteration of the training or inferencing that you want to record, you know, how many steps, um, information around CPU, GPU, you know, you can specify a callback handler for results to do whatever you, you want. Um, you can also get some extra metadata to enable, uh, you know, recording of shapes and stacks and, and, and things like that. So there's many, many advanced features that, you know, we can, we can actually, uh, you know, looking. So you can figure that based on your particular training um, scenario, what, what would be best exactly. for what you're using and, and what you're building. And then um, and then the code on the right is how it's implemented then, right? That's how you're yeah. wrapping it. Okay. Yeah, essentially. Yeah. It's just three, you know, pretty simple steps. Like, in, you know, obviously doing the pip install of Torch TB profiler, and then you, you can, you know, import the Torch profiler and then, um, um, and then having an on, on trace handler, I don't know why that's a <laughs> difficult thing for me to say. Um, and so that's where, you know, you, you have your context manager 
and that's where you can specify you know if you want your to turn on memory view um, you can essentially do profiler memory equals true and then do that the same i mean there's there's documentation on on how to turn those on but it, it's just setting an argument um to true and you're essentially turn on the ability to use those features cool yep any other any questions other that anyone has as we're going through some of these things um configuration questions i think so um jose asked or uh but can we use it with torch sharp or even torch.net so torch sharp is brand new and I don't even know if it's in its prop release yet. I, I, I don't know enough about Torch Sharp. Um, I think it's a really cool program, but I would guess not. Do you know if that works with Torch Sharp? I've never heard of Torch Sharp actually, so not. So Tor Torch Sharp is for, um, for C Sharp. It's like a, a API to use Python um, Torch library, but in C Sharp. And they actually followed all the same uh, naming conventions that you would use in PyTorch, with it, which I think is really cool. Oh, okay. Wow. Um, yeah, it, it, I just like found out about it too. It's pretty new. That's why I think it's like, I don't know what version it's on or if it's even considered prod yet, but it might be. Um, okay. So I would guess, let me, um, I would guess it doesn't yet because you can't use PyTorch profiler in C Sharp. So I would say it probably doesn't, but you would have you'd have to have some sort of like prof profiler, torch, sharp, something <laughs> name like that, some sort of new thing to integrate it in. But um, that's a really cool question. Yeah, I mean, that's something to consider and look into actually. So yeah, thanks for that question. Yeah. Okay, so now we're gonna see the magic happen with PyTorch profilers, that's what's next. Anyone else have questions? Let's see, torch serve as a model server in PyTorch. Oh, okay, that must have been answered to a different question. But yeah, I don't I don't see any other questions. Okay. So we can okay. jump in and to see how this works. Awesome. We'll do. All right. So let's um we'll share. See, this is where should I put Seth's music back on now while we find our or maybe I should see what some of these do. Like, okay, air horn was, I think, a little much is what we decided. I like this one. I haven't had a chance to use it yet. I like it. Oh. <laughs> Did it come through? Yes, yes. I just okay, realized perfect. when you put the sound effect, you can't hear when you're talking over it. Oh, that's right. Yeah, I'll have to figure out why that is. So if I play sounds, um, it overtakes my, my audio. Yep, yep, yep. Oh, you know what? I think I, I think I know how to fix that. I'll play with it later, though. All right, let's see PyTorch work. Are we ready? Oh, you have your screen. Okay, let's grab that. Perfect. Oh, we have, there we go. Okie dokie. Are we ready? We are ready. Awesome. Okay, cool. Awesome. So let's get started with the demo. So this is a uh, TensorBoard. And like I had mentioned before, this is a um, visualization tool. Um, um, that that we use for uh, PyTorch Profiler. And the first feature I'll show is actually Memory View. So like I mentioned, Memory View is a feature that allows you to understand your time and memory consumption that may have caused you know, performance bottlenecks like out of memory errors and uh, similar to the errors that Cassie was uh, talking about. And you know, it could be like memory fragmentation issues, which um, had happened to me recently. Um, and so uh, this memory view really allows you to see, you know, uh, operators exactly by the name that are actually contributing to high consumption of memory and uh, time. So in this release, um, one thing that we've added is this um, uh, trend statistic um, a graph where you can actually see some of the trends and you know you can specify the range um, and it will you know show you the trend of the memory usage um, events within within this range uh, and like I had mentioned you know to generate this memory data you'll need to just ensure that you're setting profiler memory to true when you're instrumenting your code for for profiler 
So, and you can toggle between devices, you know, CPU, well, there's nothing in CPU, right? Um, but um, you, can, you, can, you can also search the operator by the name over here if you're, if, you know, you have a lot of operators, but essentially you can just look at the size and, you know, if things are taking really long time for one particular operator, okay, well, you should probably investigate uh, why that is. So the second feature I'd like to show is around distributed training. Can I ask a question quick? So the drop downs on the side, can you tell us a little bit about what you're clicking through over there and what, what's available here in the in the TensorBoard? Yeah, absolutely. So um, so these are just the runs that I've I've done, right? So um, you know, I'll have uh, these are, you know, when you upload a stack tracing file, um, it would get uploaded into here. So I had in one file I had a bunch of stack tracing um, uh, stack tracing files that I just uploaded there. So they all show up here. And within those stack tracing files, there's a bunch of different views that uh, were generated based on um, the context manager. When you have a context manager and turn on and off those things based on your input data, it would generate that stack tracing, uh, that um, uh, stack tracing file. And then you can be able to see these, um, these features. So I, in this particular stack tracing file um, for data one, uh, demo data one, um, there were a bunch of features that I had um, enabled, and one of them was around distributed training. So that's the one that I'm going to be selecting. Um, and then if you have workers, then it would show up here, but for this one, it does not. So yeah, good question there. And then those get uploaded. So you can manually upload them or do they get uploaded during training or how or is that kind of a configurable feature for up? Uh, what are you uploading into TensorBoard or? So you said like when we have the different traces, you you said you had a bunch of different ones you uploaded. So when I used it, I remember I um, basically set a point where I wanted it to go in my training. And then when, like, when my training completed, it automatically pushed it to that location. So yeah, I mean, there's many different okay. ways. Of I, I just did oh, it okay. like manual, manually, right? So not, you know. <laughs> No, that's cool. Cause then like you can take those files and save them like for later too. Like maybe you're running it on your desktop and you actually are like, no, I want to put those in cloud. So they're accessible. And yes, yeah. exactly. That's exactly. cool. Yeah. Um, okay, cool. Yeah. So the next feature that I'll be showing is around distributed training. Um, and, you know, let's just say, you know, perhaps speeding your model training is your goal. So you conduct distributed training. So, um, but debugging can be very complex and hard to diagnose without a distributed training view like this. So you can actually observe issues within individual nodes. So each of these views give you a different, you know, different types of information that can help you, you know, uh, diagnose the reason for some of your bottlenecks. So this is some of the information around your GPU hardware um, during the run. And it would tell you, you know, each node that's running. There's only one right here. Uh, um, and uh, you know the the hardware type and um, some of the some information around the the hardware, but down here we actually also have um, additional statistics um, and information that you can that can really help diagnose your distributed training. So, for example, let's just say if we were to take a look at this communication and um, computation overview, this is the the time spent on uh, either communication or communication computation or communication. Um, those are those spooky so, vibes. It's Halloween. Exactly. Right? Like, <laughs> it's a tongue twister. <laughs> um, so <laughs> I love that. <laughs> that was the perfect sound for this. <laughs> uh, yeah. So, um, so yeah. So for example, let's just say we're taking a look at this overview. And so if we were to look at two of these um, if we were to look at two of these uh, workers, if you notice that the overlapping time, which is the red here, the overlapping time is significantly, one is significantly larger than another. Um, this to me can suggest, okay, there might be an issue in either the workload not being balanced between um, uh, nodes or a worker is being a straggler, which can be an issue and that needs to be investigated. Um, so this is just how I would interpret, you know, 
this overview and how that can help me to identify, okay, well, maybe there's a straggler, maybe there's not a balanced workload um, in, in all these, um, in each of these nodes. So um, that's just one example. And actually down here, there is a communication operation statistical uh, graph here. And this table view um, allows you to see some, you know, detailed statistics, statistics on, um, you know, op, you know, communication operations um, in each node, and you can, you know, toggle between each of these. Um, and, you know, you can see, you know, which, what operator type is being called, like, you know, how many times is it being called? Um, you know, what's, what's the size of the data that's being transferred by each of these operators? Um, which is, which is really, really helpful to, to see, okay, well, there might be one that's transferring a lot more data than the other that can be contributing to a straggler issue or, or something like that. So how but, did you go about looking into that? Do you have any examples of that? Or like maybe an example of when like that was able to, to help with, um, optimization or is it one of those things that you take into consideration and add it into kind of the whole encompassing picture to, to make a decision? Uh, decision on, you know, investigating like a straggler or workload yeah. not being balanced. Um, yeah, exactly. yeah, I think, I think it's just the, this entire picture, like, you know, just being able to look at all these available, you know, detailed statistics and, and being able to make a decision on, okay, well, it seems like what this worker is, um, you know, there might be a straggler because of the, the huge differences between, you know, most of these, and this one seems to be kind of a, a bit of an anomaly. Okay, let's investigate this a little bit more. And then this is when you come down here and then, you know, select, you know, exactly that uh, node and just be like, okay, well, the data transfer, you know, could be a lot larger. Like, and you can start making conclusions on potentially what the reason is um, for, uh, you know, the, the low GPU utilization or some of the other performance bottlenecks that you're experiencing. And, um, and then that's when you can go back and start um, optimizing your code to uh, ensure that you know there's there's um, there's not an issue and uh, improve that bottleneck. Cool. Thank you. Yes, of course. That's a good question. Um, cool. So the next feature that I'd like to show is um, you know is around GPU, which is um, an important feature to look into because sometimes performance issues are beyond memory and they're beyond node level issues and perhaps you need to observe issues on the GPU level at every step. So let's um, take a look here. Um, so this is where the GPU utilization view sort of comes in, okay? So you can see that there's um, many, uh, there's uh, one worker, you know, you can tell the device type, there's some GPU summary, and for a GPU, um, these are the three sort of important metrics, uh, you know, GPU utilization, SM efficiency, and uh, this estimated achieved occupancy. And GPU utilization is a metric around, like, the hardware performance. And if you want finer details, SM efficiency, if you want even more finer details than achieved occupancy, is the metric to look at. Um, but you know, I'll, I'll get into that a little bit later. Um, I was going to ask if you could tell me what SM efficiency is, but do you want to answer that now, or does that more important later when you're talking? Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's up to you. Um, but yeah, so, um, for a GPU utilization, um, it's, it's a little bit, it's hard for me to, um, it's hard for me to explain, uh, SM efficiency without really getting into like, uh, some really like, uh. Okay, we can we can talk, but yeah. So um, it's yeah we 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 can we can get into it. But um, so there's let's see, um, how do I put it? I think the main thing to just kind of understand is that there's GPU utilization, and if you are looking into getting a little bit finer details on um, on like let's just say it's easier to explain on a. a on the trace view, just because you'll be able to visually see the okay. difference between GPU utilization and SM efficiency. And you'll be able to see how much finer details that you can get from SM efficiency based on the SMs um, that, that can really help 
break down um, some of the reasons for GPU utilization being low or high and um, um, stuff like that. Uh, we can get into that um, in the trace view, which will be, I think, next. Okay, awesome. Cool. Um, so, awesome. Okay, cool. So, and then we have an execution summary. So this gives you a bunch of information around, uh, you know, the time duration. And this is this graph is just a v visual of, the, of this. But I think the main thing to really look at is um, GPU utilization, SM efficiency. These are all important metrics. So, um, you know, just imagine, you know, you have a ResNet 50 model with a batch size of four. And this is a run that I have um, that of ResNet 50 batch size of four. And if I were to run that and um, I wanted to observe some of the GPU summary, I can look at this and say, okay, well, I know that my goal is 100% GPU utilization, but I'm at 24%, which is not great at all, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's very low. <laughs> so... <laughs> It is a disaster. <laughs> what are we gonna do? Uh, what are we gonna do? <laughs> um, so um, the natural next thing to you know look at is okay. Well, it's pretty low. Um, why don't we look at some of this performance recommendation? So this performance recommendation does recognize that our GPU utilization is low, and it's suggesting for us to increase our batch size to improve that, and um, also implementing TensorCore. So naturally. The next sort of run that I'm going to um, do is increasing that batch size from 4 to 32 and then having TensorCore. So you can see that our GPU utilization jumped drastically, which is great. It's awesome. Um, it's exactly what we wanted. So, um, so now our GPU utilization increased drastically. There was clearly a bottleneck before and um, even though it jumped drastically there's still room for us to improve so that's, that's huge though just by being able to look at the graph and seeing okay this looks weird um, or like we're not using all of our GPU why not and then being able to make the, the changes and get that kind of like fine detail that exactly. was kind of like without the profiler how would you know that or without a profiler you know yeah, see, that's the thing is um, this performance recommendation is really meant to help you if you um, help you just kind of take quick actionable steps. And it's uh, supposed to be a guide that's um, supposed to help you just quickly optimize because that's the goal of PyTorch profilers to really help make, uh, you know, data scientists, you know, framework engineers or uh, anyone looking to optimize their model, being able to optimize them in a quick and efficient way and having all these visuals to really um, pinpoint exactly what where the bottlenecks are so without this it's going to be very difficult <laughs> yeah I should say that so yeah awesome. um yeah and there's some profilers out there that um do this but sometimes the problem is is that they give you so much low level data that you're looking at it you're looking at it and you don't know what to do with it you can't really make sense of a lot of the metrics and some of the information that's being provided to you in the visual in the visuals so having a performance recommendation system down here that's just straightforward that just tells you like hey just uh, increase your batch size uh, it will improve your GPU utilization and then you do it and you know your performance improves that that's 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 pretty pretty awesome actually so super powerful mm -hmm. all right so um do you have low battery is that your are you plugged into power or is that oh. what is that Okay, yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. I, I think that might be me. Okay, yeah, good, <laughs> good call. Thanks so much for seeing that. It's not, I was like, I don't want to lose lose you. That would be awful. See, the, that's the spooky stuff coming back, right? Uh, yeah. <laughs> okay, I like this one too, but I think this one's too scary. <laughs> right? It's perfect for Halloween, actually. It is. And perfect for, oh no, I'm I'm doing a live stream and my, my battery is going to run out. Oh no, that, I'm that dying. Might that might be inappropriate sound effect for that. Dying. <laughs> for real. <laughs> Terrifying. Okay, okay are we cool. good? Thanks for saving my life. Really appreciate it. Um, no worries. That's an applause. <laughs> <laughs> oh wait, I got to go back to the other one. See, I got to get better at these right now. I have like multiple. There we go. Yeah. <laughs>
This is awesome. Um, cool. Awesome. Right. Okay. All right. So where we sort of left off is that we took some performance recommendations. Um, in our next run, we took the suggestions by um, having TensorCore, um, implementing TensorCore to enable this mixed prediction computation and, and um, being able to adapt calculations to accelerate the throughput of your accuracy, which is exactly shown here, and increasing our batch size. So that's great. We've, we've, we've gotten 85% GPU utilization, but 85% still room for improvement. So um, to further investigate, we can actually move to a view called TraceView. Uh, which I will move to trace view. So trace view is, oops, let me just turn this off. So trace view is essentially where you get detailed views of elements in your trace and the states that they're in and you know events in 10 millisecond buckets both on the cpu and gpu side as as shown over here um and so we actually above here you can see that we recorded a bunch of profiler steps that correspond to our training in, in iterations that we have in this case so um when we look at these when we look at this trace you can see that we have these profiler steps 16 uh, 15 16 17 uh, over here and if you were to zoom in, you'll be able to see some of the, um, you can see some of the uh, operators under these profiler steps. Um, and so you can see, you know, what, what are the operators, operators that are under each of these profiler steps. But sometimes it can be really hard to map them to your code. Um, so by implementing a record function, which is um, adding, a, adding a record function to your code um, will actually make your traces easier to understand. This is part of the reason why you're able to see these, um, uh, these operators under these um, profiler steps. So the first thing you typically do, you know, when you're trying to optimize GPU utilization um, by looking at this trace view is you take a look at the GPU utilization. So um, if we were to look over here, we can say, okay, look, yeah, you know what, you know, GPU is not bad here, but oh my gosh, there's like an unusual, unusually like large dip. Um, and that obviously is a problem, right? So you can observe a specific area in your program where your GPU is low. Um, high GPU utilization uh, means that, you know, your hardware is being used to its full extent and, you know, you're not leaving any performance on the table. You know, there's not much room for improvement. But if the GPU utilization is low, that is opportunity to increase it. So with this, we can actually investigate this unusual dip by zooming in and you know um, exploring this region over here with uh, low GPU utilization. So if we were to click over here, we can actually see that our utilization, GPU utilization is literally 0%. And then beside here, if we were to click, it's around 66.7, which is super low, but what exactly is happening here? So to get finer details, we can actually, um, to get finer details, we can actually uh, look into the uh, SM efficiency. So if we were to zoom in a little bit. Could you zoom your browser a little bit too? Brad? Sure. Would that still display fine? I think so. That better. Yeah, I think awesome. that's better. Thank, you. Thank you. Cool. Yeah, sounds good. Okay, so uh, let's see here. So uh, yeah, so if we were to investigate um, a little further, we can actually use the SM efficiency, which is up here, uh, the pink section over here, and we can ob observe this unusual dip and figure out the reason for 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 all of this. So you can see that in this area, if we were to zoom in a little bit more, you know, we have low GPU utilization. And in some of the areas that there's low GPU utilization, the SM efficiency, uh, the SM efficiency has a lot of these micro gaps in between. It's not the same, it's not as similar as 
as the way and how solid it is, you know, in the GPU utilization, there's a lot of these micro gaps, it's pretty sparse. And, you know, um, if I were to look at this, I can possibly think that, you know, or make a conclusion that or, or an observation and say, okay, well, possibly your PyTorch code could be looping over some vector or some um, data structure that you should be doing on a GPU instead. So by um, zooming in to, let's see if we were to go back to this section over here to, yeah, step 16, because this is where the GPU and SM efficiency is. If we were to uh, zoom into some of the operators in step 16, oops. Oh yeah, we can actually see it right here. You can actually see um, that the data loader is, um, let's see, the data loader is doing a bunch of iterations at the beginning of the epoch. So uh, we're gonna zoom out a little bit. So there's a bunch of iterations that the data loader is doing um, in the beginning of the epoch on the input data. And that is causing this um, GPU utilization to be low. So, um, and it's causing the GPU to idle. So if we were to look at, okay, so you saw step 16 and how there's uh, low GPU utilization, mm -hmm. we can take a look at some other PyTorch steps where uh, these profiler steps where the GPU is fine, right? You can see that the GPU utilization is fine. Mm -hmm. And if we were to zoom in a little bit, um, you know, you can see that uh, it looks pretty good from um, 16, I mean, 17, 18, and 19 uh, profiler step. Um, and they all look good, but there might be an instance where, for example, like in this area here where GPU utilization is really high and SM efficiency is really low. Um, there's many, there's a few instances like that. And that can tell me a different story based on this trace view if we were to zoom in a little bit. So if I were to look at this and say, okay, well, this high GPU utilization, low SM efficiency, what sort of conclusions can you make um, based on this trace view? It could mean that the number of um, SMs are doing, the, the, the amount of work that is provided to them is quite low. Um, and to kind of confirm that, we can actually go down to this stream seven and what stream seven is, is where all the GPU activity actually happens. So we can zoom into like this area here where the GPU is. So you're just clicking and dragging to scroll in there? Yeah, so there's this uh, area here. So you can actually drag using this nice. uh, tool and you can just zoom in using this. If you were to zoom in a little bit, and let's just click on one of these streams and go down, you can actually see, okay, the area where the GPU utilization was pretty decent and SM was pretty low. If we were to click on one of these streams, you can actually see that the data that it's being, that's being worked on is quite low. Um, and the achieved occupancy is also uh, quite low too. So um, based on this information, you can see part of the reason why the GPU utilization is low in that particular area. But that still doesn't give you enough information to really conclude um, exactly why that is and why is that happening. So one thing that you could do, um, the next sort of natural next step is to enable this new feature that we um, looked into that we released in this um, new feature that we released in this um, in this uh, new version. Release. Yeah, this new version. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, <laughs> and, uh, you know, we can actually, let's just say, we want to zoom in and there's one operator that we are interested in looking into. You can see by implementing this async GPU, um, it actually can map uh, back to the CPU to see exactly which Python functions are being called and exactly which operators are being called 
in this you know particular area that this GPU utilization is really low. So uh, we can now use those Python functions that are called in the areas where the GPU utilization is low and um, figure out exactly how to improve it, whether it's to do it, to, to have it on a GPU, on a CPU instead, or a fused kernel or any other technique that can um, help improve, improve that um, um, on, on the CPU uh, with these Python functions or PyTorch operators. Um, yeah, and I think the last thing I'd like to show is that there's another uh, feature that we added as well around um, backward and forward pass. So, so let's just say, you know, um, let's just say, you know, um, there's a problem in step 18. So I think this is step 18 um, that caused like a low GPU utilization. Um, and we can actually um, see that with, with implementing this flow event backward forward, um, if you were to zoom in a little bit more, um, there's quite a few of them. But if there's a particular problem with one um, with one particular area, you can see that uh, that uh, the problem is on the forward pass, which is the left side here, and it's actually replicated on the um, backward pass too. So you can use this information and really be able to take that, track it back to the CPU, and uh, investigate exactly you know how to optimize that in your code. So there's just a lot of this is, can be a very complicated, uh, you know, it could be really complicated, but there's steps to kind of take to make sense of some of the bottlenecks that you can have and really, really dive a lot deeper into this. And um, this is part of the reason why um, this is the first time really doing a demo on trace view on a deeper level. It is a little bit complicated, but if you um, spend the time to really understand some of the features that are available around uh, trace view, really, really um, nailed down exactly where the bottlenecks are um, that could be hard to diagnose in general. So um, I think that's it for my demo is, here. Is there um, documentation to help with that part for the PyTorch profiler? Or is there um, resources that you would recommend for people to kind of use to better understand some of the information that they're able to get? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, in the in my slides, actually, and um, I had a, uh, a few extra slides, but um, we are at the hour mark, but- You um, can go over if you want, it's totally fine. I think we can- Okay, maybe I'll like stack like five, 10 minutes. Um, yeah, just, absolutely, go for it. Okay, cool. Um, but we do have references to answer your question. There's references okay. at the end of my slides that we Fantastic. can- Fantastic, I got ahead of, ahead of the game. Awesome, <laughs> yeah, you did. Um, cool, so I'm guessing you can't see my slides yet. Does anyone have any questions on the, the demo there? Seeing some of the ways, the different um, parameters that you can get some of the diagnostic information and how you can kind of zoom in and get more information. Any, any questions on that? No? So everyone's so quiet today. Okay, I need a crickets sound effect. I don't, <laughs> I don't know where it is. I'm, maybe I have one, but I have to work on like making favorites here, but. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Oh, did we lose your screen again? Uh, should be sharing. Uh, so someone's asking if PyTorch Profiler is TensorBoard. No, um, that is a good question and it can be very confusing actually. So mm -hmm. TensorBoard is a visualization tool um, that other profilers actually use too. Um, so PyTorch Profiler um, you know, a few years back was a profiling tool as well, except the only way that you would get your um, profiling information is through a console dash looking thing. Um, but, um, you know, recently we just realized that, you know, this console manager was, was not really, it wasn't nice enough. We didn't have all these nice graphics that you see here. So what um, the collaboration between Microsoft and Facebook is, that um, you know, we worked together on exporting this old console, um, you know, just by doing a print statement, <laughs> to be able to um, 
save these inputs into and, and then the traces in a train in a Chrome trace file to be able to visualize on this tool called TensorBoard. So if you were to do a pip install of Torch TV profiler to be able to use the profiler, um, it would need to be in conjunction with um, TensorBoard to be able to see these um, nice visualizations. Um, because I think if you just do, um, if you just install PyTorch, you're just gonna have to use that console. Um, and that's the older version, Autograd, older version. Um, but the new version of PyTorch Profiler is using and um, um, visualizing your Chrome Trace files on this TensorBoard. And that's how you get the pretty nice um, visuals. And I have a question on that too, because I think you had it open in the browser and you had it open in VS Code, right? So I can open it in either location? Yeah, yeah. Um, so um, the way that I like to use it, yeah, you can open, because it's a Chrome Trace file, you can open it on the browser. Um, yeah, I just, I even, uh, I, you can even like, yeah, you can open it on the browser and just by, you know, um, um, like just by typing like TensorBoard and log directory and then bind all and you'll be able to get if you have it on your desktop or something like that. Yeah, you can just upload it uh, and like using localhost. Um, and yeah, there's many different ways of using using cool. it. But there's documentation um, on the different ways of doing it. You can even have it um, from 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 uh, what's it called? Uh, blob. From blob storage. Mm -hmm. OK. So that's cool. So I know we saw like a lot of it in VS Code, but I want to make sure it's clear. It's like TensorBoard. You can use in VS Code. You can use it in uh, um, lots of different ways. And then, yeah. Yeah. I think that as long as you have a Chrome Trace file, you can um, you can pretty much um, upload it to um, or use it with TensorBoard. Um, so that, yeah, that's however way you get there is completely fine. Um, cool. Um, awesome. So um, I think the last few things I'd like to talk about is just quickly over some of the uh, integrations that we have and then uh, looking into some of the upcoming features that are pretty exciting. So um, so one of the um, integrations that we have is with PyTorch Lightning. Um, we have um, we also have integrations with um, Kubeflow pipelines. Um, and this is, uh, if you see here, this is actually an end-to-end -end integration of a BERT model view where you can run your pipelines in Kubeflow and you'll be able to directly jump from there to see the TensorBoard with a profiler right there in the pipeline view, which is super cool. <laughs> so that was an interesting um, integration that we have. So um, down the road, these are a few things to kind of uh, expect, like we are hoping to um, um, you know, add module level views and some more information that can really help you um, diagnose your bottlenecks and um, be able to, to, to uh, optimize your model a lot quicker. So uh, a few to look into uh, that are pretty interesting um, that are upcoming, like uh, one example is a uh, Python function tracing. So Sometimes when you look at a trace view, there could be some gaps on the CPU side. It looks like nothing's happening. Um, so, you know, you're probably thinking like, you know, what's going on to lead to CPU being idle, which a lot of profilers don't have. Um, this essentially gives you what's going on as long as you're using um, Python and um, it will give you all the function calls um, um, to be able to help diagnose exactly what are the issues. And then we also have a, um, coming up, we also have a module view, uh, which is pretty cool because again, in Chrome Trace, you get a lot of low level Python operators, but sometimes you can't even get the module name. So this module uh, attribution um, feature maps the time consumption in the modules in your Python um, script, uh, which can be very helpful. And then the last one I'd like to highlight is around graph visualization, which is a, a, a sneak peek on a, a feature that we're working on to help visualize your PyTorch models uh, in a graph form, which is uh, really helpful. So um, yeah, I think to end off, these are a few uh, references on um, you know how to get started um, 
you know, it, to see, you know, if there's certain scenarios that you have around PyTorch Profiler to see if it's a good fit. You know, we have a bunch of talks that we've done on GTC, um, a bunch of uh, profiler recipes, like quick getting started, some PyTorch Lightning samples and PyTorch Kubeflow samples as well. Um, so yeah, this is a few references. That's awesome. Is there any um, like GitHub links or get started links? Is that also in there as well that we could, um, could you send me those and I could paste them in the chat? Or actually, yeah. I think I might have your presentation too. Yes, absolutely. Actually, I just realized the GitHub link is not on here. So it should oh, no. be GitHub Kineto. Let me see if I can find that one. Well, that's an important, that's like the most important. <laughs> so I have, it's not the PyTorch slash profiler. That's not the right one. Uh, no, it should be Kineto. Oh, I see it. Okay, perfect. Yeah. I will paste this in the chat. Uh, so the profiler, I think that GitHub is like the older version of PyTorch profiler, Autograd, but then Kineto is the um, PyTorch TensorBoard profiler. Okay, so that's why it has kind of a different name. Mm -hmm. Yes. So the, the new one is the one that you get the cool visuals and not a printing a console. <laughs> so I need to get a second uh, two computers. And so like the one that I can chat on is over here. So I'm just going to be off screen here for a minute. <laughs> cool. Well, this was awesome. Um, this was super helpful because I've used I've used Profiler before, but I haven't used any of like the new features and mm -hmm. Um, it looks like they've been, there's been a lot of enhancements, which is awesome. And a lot of cool ways to dig down into your deep learning models to kind of like understand how you can better utilize your hardware and, and make sure your trainings go faster, which saves us all time. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Um, and then I, th I think you showed some code earlier. It's like, isn't it like three lines of code to add it or like, it's not. Cause like one of the things when I see some of these tools, I think about, okay, that's really cool. How long is it going to take me to actually mm -hmm. add it and use it in my, in my project? And I think. I think I saw that it was like just a few lines of code, right? You just like wrap your training. Yeah, it's it's essentially three steps, you know, and obviously importing the the package and then having having that on trace handler and then having that um, a context manager which you wrap your code in, and mm -hmm. that essentially allows you to just turn on and off things and then have a uh, a p step. So in your actual training code, you'll need to just add a p step where the the loop happens and and essentially that's 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 about it and then you'll be able to use uh tensorboard uh and profile your and find some bottlenecks in your pytorch model so yeah awesome, awesome. um anything else to add or think about i think we went through a lot um but is there anything else to kind of think about or, or kind of ideas about profiler, any things to consider. So like, would you run it on all of your trainings or would you only run it when you're wanting to do profiling or um, like, what are some of those like best practices of using yeah. profiler? Yeah, I mean, like, um, I think if you are running into, you know, for example, errors like out of memory error and you're trying to figure it out and you just can't, you know, you, you want to be able to optimize some bottlenecks. So unless you have bottlenecks, I wouldn't run it, you know, every single time because no need, right? But, right. Um, you know, if you have bottlenecks or, you know, uh, GPU utilization and consumption and time is important to you because of the workload that and the scenario that you're working on, um, then using that profiler, um, you know, if you're using distributed training and, you know, if you've done distributed training, you would know that sometimes it's a black box trying to diagnose it because sometimes they will just treat the entire, um, you know, distributed training as, as one huge um, operator. And then you won't be able to figure out exactly where to diagnose and figure out where the, the, the issues are um, so that, you know, using the profiler is helpful. Um, um, so it just depends on the scenario that you're trying to do, but definitely if you have some bottlenecks or if you just want to genuinely improve the performance um, and it's taking a long time to run, figuring out why. Um, so, um, yeah, I think that makes things. sense. So it's like, I want to see why, you know, something's happening or why I'm getting out of memory. Like I need to look into this deeper and I'm not getting enough debug information. So I'm going to use profiler. Mm -hmm. 
kind of reminds me of like SQL Profiler too, which I've used yes. like when I was. So yes. the kind of the same thing where you're looking into what's actually happening here and why, how can I fix it? Exactly. And I think it's helpful for folks that are either beginners or folks that are, um, you know, really deeply uh, looking for low level uh, information, because as you saw, like in the demo, mm -hmm. I did progress from something that's like, oh, here, it tells you exactly what you need to do. Actionable recommendations, just right, change right. the batch size to, you know, to increase your GPU utilization. And it was, you know, it was actionable steps on how to do it to something that's a little bit low level. Um, and you get a lot of detail and a lot of, you know, things to consider. So it, it really helps a variety of people, uh, depending on what you're looking for. So you don't need to use all the um, features, you can turn on and off the things that matter to you. And if you are a beginner, um, you know, there's, there's, uh, you know, using the recommendation, um, um, you know, uh, system to help you take, uh, let you know how to improve your performance and taking the actions on it uh, would be helpful. And if you're, you know, looking into deeper, deeper things that are a little bit more complicated than maybe diving really into the trace view would, would, would be the place. So yeah, it just depends on where you are and what you want to get out of it. But uh, essentially anyone can really make use of it. I feel like too, with the trace view, even at the beginner level, um, when you're running things and I'm very much one that likes to like run things and then pick apart how it's working and like reverse engineer things. So mm -hmm. I think Kind of cool to run it and then like dig into what's happening at each and then you can kind of like get a deeper understanding too so um, for as a learning tool you could use it as a learning tool as well um yes. when you're trying to you know better understand deep learning and how you know each epoch and steps are are performing on the hardware that yeah no that's actually very true um i didn't realize it from a learning perspective because you're right like you you <laughs> can be able to see okay well these uh, you know i you know if you notice an unusual dip in your gp utilization you know, your, that trace view will be able to tell you um, what operators and uh, functions are being called in that particular area. Okay, well, maybe I should look into like how to optimize it. And, you know, you might be looping over something that should be done on a GPU, um, but that's by looking at a trace view, you'll be able to tell that. But from any other type of information, you won't be able to tell that because it's just very top level. Um, yeah, that's a good point, actually. Yeah, I like that. That's cool. And then also, I know, like, if you're running in Azure, you get some information, but you don't get this level. Like, you can see what your GPU utilization is if you're using, like, Azure Machine Learning, which is helpful. Mm -hmm. um, but it's not going to give you that, like, level. Is there any integration to Azure Machine Learning with this yet? Uh, we are working on that. Okay, awesome. <laughs> but you that would can... be fantastic. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, yeah. So, I mean, you can use an Azure Machine Learning uh, model and, and be able to do um profiling but uh in terms of like having a full integration that's something that um is okay. down the line that we're considering yeah so i can use it with azure machine learning it's just not like default there, yeah it's not right? it's not like okay. a intuitive integration uh, but yeah you can use an azure machine learning model and yeah be able to profile based on that yeah i love it any any other questions people have for sabrina on the profiler i feel like um this is an order <laughs> that was really awesome like I, there was a lot of questions that i had about profiler that were, was answered so thank you so much for um showing us and and chatting about uh profiler thank you for inviting me thanks for you know being my soundboard no pun intended <laughs> <laughs> and, and wearing your awesome hat <laughs> oh, that was a nice laugh for wasn't it that <laughs> was good i liked that one <laughs> No, you yes, were. We <laughs> thank you so much, and and thanks for everyone like dealing with me figuring out my soundboard because this is just a little too cool. Like I could just like show you, I have it on this little phone on my phone. And oh, then that's I have a... how you were doing it. I was yeah. wondering how quickly you were, you know, pressing those. Uh... Oh wow. So I think I'll like I need to get a better screen for it, so it's not just my phone. But yeah, I I just hooked it up today with my a little mixer and my preamp with my phone and I'm like, hey, I could make this work. I love when things like that happen. And you're like, why didn't I do this before? I love when, that. Seth has big shoes to fill. Like, you know, he has all the cool sounds and I'm like, I gotta try. <laughs> so hopefully <laughs> no, I'm awesome. proud of my sounds. <laughs> okay. Um, awesome. So I think we'll can move into what we're gonna talk to next. Are you gonna hang out or are you gonna head out or you're, you're welcome to. I will yeah. probably hang out for the next 15 minutes and then I have a meeting and then, uh, yeah. That's cool. Awesome. Okay. Let me get my stuff. So we're, I'm going to be showing you, I'm working on a template. 
Um, let's go back over to. This I'm excited. Thing. So you're you're working on your personal project. Is that is that right? Um, well, it's actually going to be something that will be available to everybody. So what it is going to be is we have um, a new product, Onyx Runtime Web, which allows you to run machine learning models in the browser. Mm -hmm. And so one of the things with when you're inferencing, you know, with JavaScript, you have to do all your data preparation with JavaScript. And that means, you know, moving things to tensors, resizing for images, um, and, you know, all those like pre-processing things that need to happen. Mm -hmm. And and sometimes you can use like pre-built models and Onyx runtime and implement stuff into your project without necessarily having a deep learning background or maybe like that. So my goal is with this particular project, and let me oh, get up my screen here, see which, I don't know which one of these is going to be best for this. Ah, this one. Okay. Um, so here it's uh, going to be a template. So if you use GitHub templates, um, they're basically just, you can go right in and instead of cloning, you go create template and then you have a working example. And so what this one actually does is, uh, I have an up here. Um, it's just a really simple uh, implementation of SqueezeNet, which is a vision model um, that is optimized for web. So it's smaller, so it's gonna be faster and work better on web. And so basically what the sample project does is this, you run inferencing and it comes back with a result and then how long it took to inference and you can just cycle through. So not really that exciting, but if you have a computer vision project that you're trying to get implemented, this has all the code that you need to basically get it working in a, in a web app. And this is actually a static web app. So this isn't even, it doesn't have a backend. This is all running in browser um, using Azure static web apps. So it's just really cool that you can even do that. So what the, the goal of this then is to make it really kind of easy to go, okay, here's the code that I need and I have this model, or maybe you wanna to go to the Onyx model zoo and grab one of ours or use the one that's built in. And then you can easily add computer vision into your existing project or use this one. So what that's do users need to come in? So now that there's this template, like what do users need to come in with? Is it like other than their own data or? Um... Yeah, that's so you could you could you probably want to come in with your own data. So there's like I have this um, just sample um, set of data or of images that it cycles through. So you probably want to create your own images. Maybe you want to add an image upload. It depends on what your use case is. And so um, the the idea is uh, more about getting the the logic of getting your prediction. Um, so that you can already implement, because generally when you're going to come in and say, hey, I want to add machine learning to my web app, um, yeah. you're probably already going to know like why you want to do it. And so if you want to do computer vision for, I don't know, whatever reason, like Seth's app that he's building out on this is a computer vision project for rock, paper, scissors, Spock. Yeah. <laughs> and so that's an example where you could, and I think it's a his is a static site, I believe. I haven't been keeping totally up on where it's at, mm -hmm. uh, but this would be something that you could come in and say, hey, um, I want to use this. How do I use it? Because there is some configuration that needs to happen as well, which, um, yeah, so it's kind of supposed to be like a quick start. And this one I used React and I used Next.js, which is a implementation of React because I have, I've been avoiding using React. I'm not going to lie. Like, is, I, it um, is it easier to use uh, Next? Or like what's yeah. the compelling reason that you... Uh... There's a lot of things that you get in uh, React or in um, out of the box with Next.js, uh -huh. like a lot of configuration stuff that you'd have to do yourself. So you can just be like, I think it's like next app create or something or create app. Like there's like a very simple CLI and it sends up kind of all the scaffolding that you need, like your, oh, your config. So this one is using Webpack. So uh, Webpack is a package manager for web. web and yeah. um, let me see here. And what they have the kind of their own implementation, but then it also comes with some of the things that you need for it. Although this one is, I did augment this one for Onyx Runtime because I'm using the, why isn't my Zoom working? Oh, well, I guess it doesn't want to work, but okay. Hopefully you can see that okay. The, uh, anyways, the, uh, there's two different backends for the using Onyx Runtime web. And you can use Wasm, which is WebAssembly. And you can use WebGL, which is a graphics library that allows the JavaScript to access the GPU on your machine. So in this example, I'm using the Wasm backend. And so the Wasm uses the C uh, CPU and then the uh, WebGL uses the GPU. 
And so in order to make sure that in my my uh, disk folder, my build folder, so that's the difference, like if you're using Vue, which is another JavaScript framework or, or React or um, Angular, they have different kind of like common build folders where you build out your static site to. Um, so for, for React, it's a build file, and then you need to copy all the files over that that then you would use for deployment of your static site. So one of the things that we need to do, and that's in this template, is to grab our Wasm file from our node modules and copy that over to our <clears throat> excuse me, copy that over to our build file. So that's kind of an example of like a con configuration that you would have to think about or know, or maybe go find in documentation that where if you have a template project, it's just there for you. Um, and, and you don't necessarily have to use the template. It might just be something that you would use as a reference as well. So this is something like I just finished this week. It's actually not quite complete. It's, it's almost there. Um, but yeah, so I was going to kind of talk through what I did to to build out this. Although I want to try to restart my Zoom it because um, Zoom it is like really helpful to actually see the code. Otherwise, I feel like sometimes it's like really hard to see things. So give me one second. Zoom it's awesome. If you don't have it, do you use Zoom it on any of your stuff? No, I never heard of it actually. <laughs> oh my gosh. Okay. Yeah, I don't know why it stopped. Let's see, does it? Yeah, actually. So you use. Um, so this is like you just start it, and so Control One is what you do to mm -hmm. zoom, and then you, there we go, and then oh, you can okay. also like drop. No way. Yeah. So like oh. I, I really like it because I'll be looking at this config, and I can see it really well on my my 32 inch screen here. But I'm assuming that this is really hard to see for other people. But if I do this, so now you can see good. easier that it's where where I'm grabbing it, and that I'm using this copy plugins. One thing that I found a little bit different about using Next.js config versus like a Webpack config. So either way, you're going to be using this copy plugin, but the way they implement it is a little bit different in Next. And I don't know if that's also with React because I haven't used React outside of Next. Um, okay. But this one was recommended to me because I've always been like avoiding, and I don't do a lot of web development anymore. So it's like, I don't really have to learn React. Yeah. Um, but this was like recommended as a good way to kind of get started with it. It also adds a lot of like debugging tools that are really nice that I don't think, I think they're specific to next. Like it yeah. was really, really easy when I had a bug, when I was breaking something, maybe I'll break something and show you, it has a big pop-up and it shows you exactly where it is. And kind of like with profiler where you clicked the link and it brought you directly to the source code. Yes. It, it does the same thing oh, cool. um, for bugs in your, in your web app. So that I, I think is a Next.js feature. Let's see, do I have Next.js up? Yeah, here. So this is how they kind of talk about the React framework for production. Um, and there, so there is a server side too. Like there, that's the other cool thing that I found about using this particular um, template is when you go into your, uh, where is it? There's another config here. Okay, so in the package.json, like when I do npm run build or npm run dev, you know, if, if you're familiar with web development, you know, when you're you're running your development version or your, um, and that's going to do hot reloading for me as well. Um, but if I want to try out my production build, I can do npm start, but the npm export is going to also give me my static site distribution. Hmm. So you kind of have the option if you want to do static site or if you want to do a backend API. And then with with the Azure Static Web Apps, when you deploy it, you can actually set up a Azure Functions like uh, backend with for for serverless backend to your web app. So I found it to be quite nice. Like with the, the hardest parts were honestly things that I didn't know about React. So I created this um, component. Um, so web components are kind of like the go-to. I feel like like Vue is all component based too, and I love web components. Like that part of like the web concept, I absolutely love makes reusable code really easy and kind of like segments things out. Um, so yeah, I think some of the only things was like how React is stateless. So in order to actually implement state and DOM manipulation, I had to kind of figure that part out where um, mm -hmm. I, I used Angular 1, like where, when it first came out and there was like two-way model binding and it was really easy to kind of update um, those things. So that was some of the learnings that I got just from using React, which I guess it's not even what this is about, but it is it is cool and it is good to know um, if you go and use this template. So I'm hoping to have this available next week. So if I don't have a, a GitHub link for everybody um, right now, but oh, it looks like we have some questions. Let's see, learning React, it's been way harder than learning ML for me. I agree with this. 
like this is true <laughs> like i was trying to figure out <laughs> some of the things that react and i was like this is harder than machine learning like it's it's really complicated yeah um and, and it is really complicated so i think with react it's just a really big learning curve and then i will be making another one with view i really like i think view is really easy to use um if you're familiar with web development and it follows a lot of the same patterns that you're probably already used to so like view is just much easier still kind of follows like a web component um, framework and so i'll implement the same thing in view um, after after this one's all done mm -hmm. but like some of the like examples of of doing machine learning stuff in javascript which did i miss any questions let me still check it yes okay um he said isn't that the kind of project that seth was working on um, for the last episodes. And yeah, he's, I think he's also using React Next, I believe. Um, one of our coach, uh, Be Beatrice, you guys probably know her. She's been on uh, the show before. Uh, she is, she knows React. And I think she was the one that actually recommended um, Next.js as, as a good way to use and implement React. And I, and I will say it was, I feel like it was much easier than trying to just go straight React. Um, Cool. So let's look a little bit at some of the code we have here. So this is my web component, which is drawing my image and getting my inference. So when I when I hit the get inference, um, this is where all the logic is happening. And then in my pages, in my index here, um, I'm just imp importing my image canvas element. It's a T, uh, I think it's called a FTX element. Wait, let me see what's it called again. JSX element. Um, so I'm importing that here and then I'm just calling it in my UI. So this is building my index page and um, setting the height width, which is sent in to my web component and then any other kind of just basic thing. So the title. So this is kind of your main page of that. But really the most most of the like you're just importing the, the component and then all of the logic is happening in the uh, component and then also in some of our helper functions, which I split out specifically so that if you were like just wanting help with like images to tensors in JavaScript, which is kind of hard and there's not, it makes it hard to find. So in the image helper, it goes specifically into how do I get my image? How do I um, augment that and, and resize it? And so I'm using this file or this library that I found and it has all kinds, I'm going to pull it up. It's really cool. It's image. If I can type, here we go. Did they have documentation? I thought they did. Maybe it's just on an NPM. But basically, there was all kinds of ways to um, transform and manipulate in JavaScript for images. And so that's kind of what I was looking for, because there's a lot of different types of image you might like in this example, we're using very generic kind of images for this type of model, and it's very like beginner, right? But if you're doing your own stuff, you might need to um, do something like uh, type configurations or different. There's there's all kinds of stuff. Grayscale, like maybe you don't want to do color, you want to switch to grayscale, resize. You could change the quality, um, and then you can also output too. So like maybe you want to grab them and just like process them into a different output folder that's then ready for machine learning. And then you'll just read from that and process through. So there's like a lot of different. So that's why I kind of liked this one. Um, I don't know if anybody else has any other recommendations because I really just started reading. Like what I do with I start with anything. I'm like, let me read and see what's out there for image processing in JavaScript and in TypeScript. And I found this one to be kind of the easiest to use, and I thought it had the most like the most features built in. Um, so let me go back here. So that's all this is doing is it's grabbing from a path. Um, another way that a lot of people are doing this, and I think the way Seth is doing it as well, is if you have, if you're actually uploading, because he has a video stream, stream and he's doing um, captures and um, uh, processing from there. And so in that case, you might not use this particular one because I'm specifically reading from a path, like a URL or a local directory. And I think he's reading directly from the context of the canvas element. So if you already have, if you're grabbing an image from the canvas element in JavaScript, um, you might not need this unless you want to do additional uh, configuration to that image. So if you still want to do different like resizing and different, you know, black and white configurations or, or whatever, um, I don't know if there's good ways to do that in JavaScript. So that's kind of what this is, this is about is like, here's a way that's an easy jumpstart to start doing that. 
Um, so let's go back here quick and talk about the components. So with React, in order to update the state, I have to use state and set that since it's stateless. And then from here, I'm just grabbing the uh, get image. Let me Cassie, I'm right. I have a meeting right now, but uh, oh. this was super awesome. Thank you so Thanks much. Right and uh, I'll see you next time. <laughs> Good. This awesome. Bye. This is a really, really cool project. <laughs> awesome. Take care. All right, I think I can just go here. Perfect. All right, that was awesome. I, I love the the project that she's working on, and it's it's so needed too. So it's really great progress, and that's been going there, and fun to see it working. So, wait, see that's the problem with my soundboard being on my phone. I'm really down to okay. okay. Um, so where were we? Okay, so to kind of talk through some of the code here. We are grabbing these image URLs, which I showed you from that file earlier when we were talking about where are you getting your data or, or what data are you using. And then we're loading that into a string array or an object array that has text and value. And then I'm just grabbing random ones from it. I could maybe just cycle through because I think there's only like, you know, 10 images in there. I could just cycle through sequentially, but um, adding random there just for the demo purposes. So like, would you actually, if you actually use this template, this might not be something you would need. Um, unless you're doing more of a demo or some some sort of uh, uh, different um, way of getting your data, however you're trying to get your data in. Okay. So then, oh, I just saw that. Need a little zoom on the code. Thanks, Jay. Yeah, we got it working now because th that always happens. It, it It's like, even though I feel like I have a very large text, it's it's so much better to um be able to kind of get it nice and readable so for display and run image or display image and run inference on this particular one if i scroll down i'll show you this quick so that makes more sense this is my actual um, html which i had to get used to putting html in my javascript files because if you if you've been around longer you know that it was always like that was like taboo so the fact that we react puts HTML in JavaScript to render it was something that I also had to get used to. Um, but it, it does, it is nice. It is nice to have like all of the, the logic and the the, H, the markup together in an easy reusable web component. So I do really like that part. Uh, but if you look down here, so this is my display and run image. So if I click over to my, okay, I have a lot of stuff up here. Let's close some of this. Here we go. Um, if we click over to this, this is this here. So when I click and run uh, the an inference, it's getting that random image and then it's putting it through my inference code. So let's take a look at what's happening here. So I'm creating an image and this is an HTML image. And then I'm get calling that get image that we just looked at. So I'm getting one of my sample images. I'm setting the source to the value, which in our case is the URL. Um, and then I'm also updating, there's some labels that I have in the confidence score. So when you actually get that result back and it displays below the image, um, I'm clearing that out as we run our inference. Um, the one that we updated to is really quick. If you do something like ResNet, it takes more like one to 1 1.5 seconds um, because it's a larger model. So this is really only needed if you think your inferencing is going to take a while. Um, if, you if you're going to have something that's pretty lightweight and quick, you, you won't even really need this part. Um, so then we're getting that canvas element, getting the context, and then drawing drawing the image that we just set up. So once we have the image displayed, then we are submitting the inference. And I hope to go down here. You can see that we're just sending in that image.source, which is the URL, and then we're going to get back our results and how long it took, and then we're going to display that on the screen. So let's jump into our inference code. So for the inferencing squeeze net, so that's the other thing is right now, I, I have a few different models that are from the model zoo. If you're not familiar with the Onyx model zoo, let me show you that. Here we go. I will paste this 
oh, I can't paste this in the chat. Sorry, we'll get that later. But anyways, it's GitHub slash Onyx slash models. And um, here we have different uh, models available. So when I was talking about like, if you are going to describe a model and then you wanna just do inferencing um, in JavaScript, this is like, if you're gonna do image processing, this is gonna have a lot of that boilerplate code that you'll need to do inferencing with Onyx. Um, and so here's some of the different models. You might have to update the classes. So for ours, um, we have this ImageNet class um, object that has all of the, like the index and then also what it is. So these map directly to the pre-trained model. So if you you're using a different model, you'll want to update uh, to your different classes. So for for all of the ImageNet models, um, which are these, you can they were trained on the same classes. So or labels. And so you can um, just use this. But if you're you if you're doing a custom model, let's say you grab this code and you want to put your own model in, and you want you have to you need to have different classes, obviously, because it's yours. You would want to update um, this class here to whatever the classes are for your your model. So that's a little bit about the model zoo and kind of some of the the implementations that you need to do. And so right now I only have the the squeeze net, but you can actually run any of these. Um, and if I go into inference squeeze, or I have so inference squeeze net, get image. Okay, so this is what we talked about before, where I was showing you the different image processing things that happen. Um, so th the other way that you could use this template is let's say you just need help with image process. You have everything else down, you just need to know. Well, you can come in here and see how I did it in this particular project. Um, and it's really helpful, uh, particularly because a lot of the times when you go to look up how to pre-process things, it's in Python and not JavaScript. So it's helpful to kind of have some sample codes of different ways that you could do that. This repo is awesome. Thank you. I'm pretty excited about it. I've been working on it all week and um, really excited to get it out into a template and uh, write a blog around it too. So I'm, I'm, it's kind of like a sneak peek at what's gonna come. Um, Okay, so then let's see. So from here, from when we're getting the image, right, we're setting in what our, our dimensions are. It's gonna default uh, to the image net dimensions. Uh, and then we are going to load the image from Tensor, which we talked about when I was kind of going over this. And then, or I'm sorry, from Path, all the image from Path to create a Tensor, that's what I meant to say. Um, and then we're gonna return back that uh, object. And then here we can, we're resizing it to the height and width that was sent in, which again, we're defaulting to that 224. And now that I'm looking at this, I probably maybe should update this height and width coming from the dimensions. Yeah, I think I should do that. Well, I'll, I'll try it out later. We'll, so I want to make sure we we get through this and then we can play around because the other things I might I thought it'd be fun to try to update to WebGL because I haven't tried this with WebGL yet. I've only tried it with uh, WebAssembly. Something to note about that too, uh, all of the offsets um, are, and operators are supported in WebAssembly. Uh, WebGL, um, it's brand new. So, or well, not WebGL, but the WebGL support for it is new. And so there is scenarios where you might not be able to use that particular uh, backend for processing. So that's why I'm not sure if the, all the operators or which which operator, which offset I'm gonna need to um, use for a WebGL. So if we, if we get through all of this, we will look at that. And see see if it works okay so i'm loading my image i'm getting my image uh to a tensor so here i'm gonna so rgb we're gonna create an rgb array of arrays and we're gonna get all of the the buffer data from the object and then put the into those arrays we're gonna transpose it into the right format and then um we're able to create that uh, float 32 array to get the data by looping through the transpose data, and then we're returning our tensor data. And so then when we return that, oh, that's a Visual Studio. Oops, I used a Visual Studio shortcut. So in Visual Studio, if you control minus, it steps you back to where you were previously in the code, uh, code and apparently in VS Code, it, it makes it smaller, which actually kind of makes sense, like it, it zooms out. But I used to have an extension that gave me all the Visual Studio uh, shortcuts. I should probably re-add that. Is it summer day cap with headphones? <laughs> it's Halloween. This is my Halloween festivities. And 
I have some fun Halloween backgrounds because it's the Friday before Halloween. Is, is anyone dressing up for Halloween? Does anybody get really into it or are you kind of like over it? Um, I also might hang out with my my favorite sisters this weekend. Some Hocus Pocus, the best Halloween movie of all time, in my opinion. Um, but yeah, so that's why I have the hat and the cat ear headphones is to celebrate at the, the spooky weekend. So I hope everyone has a really fun and safe weekend. Um, however, you, you just decide to uh, celebrate or not. All right, let's go back to code. Where do we leave off? Okay, so we got our image um, tensor. And then let's get out of this. I believe that was from predict, right? Yeah, okay. It really is a lot easier with the control minus because you can just like step and go click, click, and then you're back right to where you were. I got to add those again. Okay, so once we get our image tensor back, we are then going to run the model and send in that tensor. Oh, and I think the other thing I wanted to show. So this tensor object is an Onyx uh, runtime tensor. So it's specific to the Onyx Runtime Web. And then this is how you actually grab the Onyx Runtime Web package um, for the uh, for doing inference in the browser. There is also an Onyx Runtime node for doing JavaScript server-side inference, and then also a React Native package. So um, sometimes people get confused on which package to do what. So web is if you want to do in-browser client inferencing. Node is if you want to do server-side um, JavaScript inferencing. And then React Native is obviously for React Native. And now, and, and I think everybody's familiar with this, I, but just so you know, Onyx Runtime can inference in many different languages, not just JavaScript. So there, you could do C Sharp. Um, let's see, what are they? So yeah, you can inference in, in all the different languages. I'm just showing the JavaScript side of things because that's what I'm working on right now. Is it recommended to do it in VS Code or can it be also in Visual Studio 2022? Um, yeah, you could do either because it's, it's just a TypeScript React um, project with using Next.js. So you could definitely use Visual Studio. I personally prefer Visual Studio for C Sharp, even though I, I could do JavaScript and Python in there. And then I use VS Code for uh, Python and um, JavaScript. And I think it's just kind of the tooling that comes with each. I know that they're adding a lot of that to, to to Visual Studio. I come from a C-sharp background, so I was writing all C-sharp for years. And so a lot of my my just default, and if you if you have any C-sharp devs out there, you know, like you get really super used to your shortcuts when you're working through things to the point, like just like, you know, CV, copy, paste, you know, um, control C, control V, how that's so natural. It happens the same with Visual Studio. And so when I first came into here, into Visual VS Code, it was kind of a hard adjustment to me because I was so used to using shortcuts. So even now, I still sometimes will hit the shortcuts. And I, I must have, um, when I reinstalled this, I must not have added the extension that um, changes that for me. So really, you can use either. You can use VS Code or you can use Visual Studio. It's really just whatever your preference is. Um, and so I, I really like VS Code, though. Now I use VS Code way more, but I'm also doing more Python and data science stuff, which is something like, for example, um, I can open up my notebooks. Oh, wait. Oh, sorry. That was a different error. I'm like, it's broken. But so when I was like testing out this code, I'm actually using um, a TypeScript notebook. So I'm using in VS Code, I'm using Jupyter Notebooks with a TypeScript kernel. So I'm actually able to do the REPL like you would do with Python, but with JavaScript to kind of go through and try different things. Um, so that's, oh, it wants me to reload. Not right now. Um, that's one thing that I like about this. But they did just add um, notebooks, from what I understand, to Visual Studio. So I think it's kind of the same experience here. So it, it really kind of just comes down to what you prefer because there's getting more and more tooling that's in, in both versus um, needing you know, the tooling in one versus the other. But I still like C Sharp more in Visual Studio, even though I do C Sharp here too. So more of a story, use what makes you happy <laughs> and makes you productive. Check in the chat, see if there's any other questions. Okay, cool. So we got back our image. Is that what I was showing here? 
Oh yeah, I was showing you the the different libraries and how we're using Tensor from here. So to me, like this part right here can take um, can take a lot of time if you're if you're new to, to machine learning or maybe you just don't know which libraries to use in JavaScript. Like maybe you're a Python dev and you're implementing something in JavaScript and um, that type of thing can help get get you started pretty quick on implementing different models. So if we go to um, run our model now, so here's where we're actually using Onyx uh, Runtime Web again to create our inference session. And then we can send in different uh, inference session options. So this is where I'm telling it that I want to use the WebAssembly backend, which I also believe is the default. So if I, if I didn't send any of these parameters in for options, um, it actually would use this automatically. But I also wanted to enable graph optimizations. And if I go to this link here, kind of like how we were talking about in PyTorch Profiler, how there's all these different ways to um, kind of configure based on what you're doing. There's a lot of those same types of things with Onyx Runtime. So if you're, uh, whatever you're doing, if there's even profiling available, um, so you can get kind of some of those other diagnostics. Oh yeah, so here's all the ones that are available. So we're using the graph optimization and then we're setting uh, the, the backend. So you can see these are the, the different levels that we can set. And we're just like, let's let's use them all. Um, so that's actually inferencing. So when it comes to like using Onyx Runtime, there's not a lot of code you need for it. It's like a few lines of code, right? I create I used the tensor object to create my tensor to send it in. I'm now create using the inference session and my um, options, my session options to create my session. And then from there, I'm going to actually run the inference by sending in my session and my pre-processed data. Um, so I separated this out because I wasn't sure if I wanted to add more than one in here. And actually, I'd be curious for feedback um, from you all what you would want, because I, was, I could make it so you could run any three of the models in here. Um, but kind of my goal was like, just keep it simple as an example of what to do, because you can easily update which model you want or extend this in the way that you want for the, t the different models. But if you come in and you see a big block of code and you got to scroll through a bunch of imp model implementations, I thought that that might not be as helpful as just having one implemented. So that's why I decided to do one implementation. I originally had all three, um, but it, I would be curious if, if, if anybody has a strong opinion either way of saying, yeah, impl implement all three, it's not, it's not too much, or just having the one example. See what we have in the chat going on over here. Um, using only in C sharp, can we do this? I think you mean can you also do inferencing in C? Yeah, you can do inferencing in C sharp, um, and you don't have to do any JavaScript. Uh, so if you have a pre-built model, you can use Onyx runtime, and then you can inference with C sharp, which is really nice and something that when I first started. Uh, and I didn't know about Onyx Runtime. It, it was something that would have made my life really easy because I was in like an all C sharp shop and I set up a, just a, a like a Flask Python API, uh, but we had all Windows servers and we were all on-prem because it was a long time ago. And they, um, at the time it would have been nice to be able to just inference in C sharp because I wouldn't have had to set up a different API. I could have just used the inference session C sharp library or the Onyx Runtime um, C sharp library and do inferencing there. So like everything that you're seeing that I'm doing in pure JavaScript, because this is all just pure JavaScript, well, I'm using TypeScript, but you know, you can do the same in all of the supported languages, including C Sharp, which is awesome. So the Onyx Blazor question, you know, I've got that question before and I am not 100% sure if we can. Like let's, um, and if you don't know what Blazor is, it's WebAssembly for C Sharp. I'm gonna Google it or Bing it and see if there's any info on it. And I, I think it's something that I need to try out because I feel like in theory it would work, but I've never actually tried because it's just it's the WebAssembly of C Sharp. And if you it could, it, I, yeah, I, I think I think the answer is yes, which is what I said last time asking. But I don't hold me to that because I have not tested it and I have I don't have can't find any documentation on it either. So that actually probably be a good thing to document for. Um, so I'll take that as a to do. I'll figure that out. So I know the answer next time because it is a really good question. It comes up. I could see how why you would want to do that. 
Um, let's see, what else do we have over here? Cool, okay, I, think, I think I got to all the questions um, that we had so far. So we'll go back to the code. I really need some music. I wish um, I had some streaming music, but there's like, does anybody have a good recommendation for a service that you can use for streaming music? Because when I'm doing this, I always have like lo-fi beats on or something like that or jazz and I feel like it's missing something. We're missing that music. Wait, let's see. I do have the sound effects though. Isn't there? Yeah, I thought I had an owl on here, but I'm not seeing it. Well, just imagine that I knew exactly where the button was and I clicked it. <laughs> okay, let's get back. Um, okay, so now we're running inference. And so we're gonna get the start and end time so that we can know how much time it took to inference. Again, something you probably wouldn't put in your, your app, but I think when you're um, when you're testing it out, it's really helpful to have that diagnostic information. So for example, when I was using the larger ResNet model, seeing that you know it was averaging 1.8 or one second to 1.8 seconds, I think is about what it was doing um, on CPU with the, the Wasm background for Onyx Runtime. That was really helpful to see. And then when I updated it, um, obviously I could see that it was a lot faster with um, with a uh, squeeze net, but uh, it's still useful, I think, because you might be bringing in your own model and wanting to see how you can optimize it. So getting the inference time, um, grabbing our inputs and creating our feeds, and then from there, we are, where's my session dot run? There we go. Oh, let me scroll. That probably is a little too small. There we go. Um, so here you can see from our pre-processed data, we're getting our inputs and we are sending in our feeds to our session. So this is actually doing the inference right here with Onyx Runtime. That, that's all we have to do to call our session. And then we have our output. So there's not a ton of code you actually need to implement it, which I think is pretty cool. It's just making sure you get to that point where your, your data is in the right shape and pre-processed the way it needs to be. Um, then I'm getting the seconds because it comes back in milliseconds. And then I'm grabbing the output and now I'm doing that soft, soft max, which I have as a helper function down here. And then this is to get the top five. So it comes back as a thousand different classes because if we look back here, there are um, a thousand different classes available in uh, this particular training model. There we go. And so if we went back here, um, this is going to loop through, sort them, and give me back the top five, which I borrowed from one of our other demos that we have, which is out right now, the Onyx Runtime Web Demo, uh, which is implemented in Vue. Wait, this is not the right project. Um, anyways, there's another one implemented in Vue. There's a lot of different ways of implementation. So it's a really good uh, code base to look at to get kind of information on it. Uh, but it, And you could download it and take what you want or whatever, like I did here. Uh, but it's, it's a bigger code base, um, but still extremely useful. And then also has it, the ability to toggle through the different models, which is the other way, reason why I was like, I don't really think we, this one purpose of this one isn't really needed, so. <laughs> Synth wave, yeah. I mean, I'm thinking that maybe I gotta use GarageBand and create some, cause I think that I could do that. I don't know if you've ever used GarageBand on the iPhone or the iPad, um, or I think it comes on Mac too, but it's a really easy way to like do music production. There's like a lot of pre-recorded loops that you can then put together to create um, songs. It's pretty sweet, pretty fun to use, like just to play with. Okay, so I'm getting my top five classes back. And then from there, I'm just returning those back to my inference result here. From there, I'm grabbing just the top one. I mean, if you want to display all five, you could. Um, again, I'm just returning the five. You can change that too. However many top results you want to get, you can update that to what you want to use. And then um, just calling it to uppercase so that it's consistent and then giving that probability and setting the inference speed and time. So that's the whole basic, basically of this project um, of how to create 
a really simple web app here where you can see that it goes and grabs an image and that's what's happening. So you can see it's a cheetah, how confident it is and how long, like super fast with SqueezeNet. So I haven't done anything to the UI here. It's really basic because uh, I wasn't really thinking about that, but I might, I might add a little bit of CSS and make it a little prettier. Um, but yeah, so that's kind of the basics of what this is. And so this will be made as a template. And I don't know if you ever used templates before in GitHub. Look, oh, static web apps. Oh, let's see. Let's see if I can find that one. They do a really nice job with, oh, is it this their gallery of static web apps? Let's see if I can find. No, that's not what I was thinking of. Anyways, somewhere in there, they have um, some different templates that you can just use. Well, I can just show you, I'll just do it here, templates. This is what, I can't find it. So basically instead of like the, the code button where you get your URL to clone, there's a template button. And when you click it, it brings you right to um, creating it in your own GitHub directory. So like instead of the same code and clone, it's template and it automatically brings you to um, actually, you know, I have one of my own. I can show you now that I think about it because I did this a similar thing for WebXR. Any XR web or um, virtual reality fans out there? So this, you just go use this template. And so that's what this will be, where you could just use this template and you're already ready to go. And then you can add in whatever you want on top of it. So this one is for Babylon JS, which is a WebXR um, library for creating uh, virtual reality experiences on the web, which is really cool. Also uses WebGL. Um, and then it has TypeScript in Webpack. So you could just click use the template and then you're right, ready to use it. So I don't know, this I just love this feature in GitHub because I think there's a lot of times people create templates and put them out there and you got a clone and and do all the things, which is fine, but this just makes it so simple and easy to start using um, some different stuff. Okay, so then we have it running. Let's stop that. And we only have a few minutes left. Is there any other questions? I don't know if I want to get in to try to um, change the the back end because I have a feeling it's it's we're gonna have a bug. I guess let's try it and if it blows up we'll just end there. <laughs> Be the end. So okay so I'm gonna change this. So to change this to WebGL I literally just go from Wasm to WebGL and um let's see here. So if I do npm run dev let's see open up the new one. Okay, was it really? Oh no, it was, it was really that easy. Okay, well, that's how you change it to WebGL. <laughs> that didn't even take a minute to do. What terminal am I using? Oh my gosh, I am using, I love Windows Terminal. This is Windows Terminal, so I'm on a Windows machine. And um, I'm also on Windows 11, so you might be seeing kind of some new uh, designs. And then this is using the Oh My Posh is what it's called, uh, theme. And there's actually, uh, oh my posh, let's see. There's a really good uh, docs. Windows, like if you go to our our docs themselves, there is a step-by-step -step on how to set this up. So you can go in here and completely set up the, the Windows theme. Um, so, and then also I have the Cascadia nerd theme, which is why you can get some of the, the fancier, um, kind of graphics and and like a font in here. So I'm a big fan. Oh, and then on top of that, I have um, like the other thing that's really handy for my data scientists is Anaconda directly in Windows Terminal. So I can go between um, different terminals uh, here. I, I like, I think this is just one of the best things and I, I highly recommend it. I think you can use it on Linux too. So like, well, I know that I have, so I have WSL also. So if I want to run things in WSL, I can open up my WSL uh, terminal. 
Um, I think you can do, oh wait, that might be the preview vision. You can also do like split screen. There's like multiple different screens you can do. But I think I, this is not the preview version. The preview version has some other things. Um, oh, and you can get right into your cloud shell as well. So if you want to run um, Azure Cloud Shell um, locally in your Windows terminal, it's really handy. So yeah, that's the terminal. Highly recommend it if you haven't used it. And then the there's lots of different themes in Oh My Posh too. I should show that quick because there is, oh, I have one minute left. Um, I think you can make your own theme. So like here's mine my theme that I'm using, uh, but you kind of have options to do different different themes here as well. So yeah, that that's really cool to know that literally all I had to do to switch to WebGL, and then was that faster too? I guess I didn't notice if it was faster than um, CPU. I think that's about the same as uh, CPU was. So there you go, that's the template that will be um, available soon. I'm hoping it'll be in the Microsoft repo uh, by next week. But um, yeah, so thank you so much for hanging out with me today. This is really fun. And um, it's always fun to uh, fill in for Seth. And wait, I can applaud for myself. Right? Um, thank you so much for hanging out with me today. We'll uh, see you next time.